and it is expected that Hilda will make a full recovery. She is one stalwart hedgehog. But in other news, it appears the Americans have been working on something new. The KR-71. From what we are led to believe, this plane is capable of Mach 3 flight and is almost completely undetectable. Dear God, how did we come by this information? Is our man stateside okay? I do hope he wasn't caught placing unnecessary use in words or by getting confused over the contents of a pie. No, no, sir. James is just fine. The Americans actually came to us about this. They want to station one at Royal Duxford. Hmm, I see. As well as the aforementioned abilities, we also have reason to believe it can carry anti-satellite hardware and may be able to target devices in low Earth orbit. Good God! Without even launching a rocket to space? I'm afraid so, sir. Well, we have no time to lose. We must design a plane like this KR-71, something that can go very fast and nigh on undetectable. How do the Americans manage this again? Oh, not to worry. We'll just make it go really fast below radar altitude. That will work. Okay, sir. Jolly good. Oh, and also make a plane that can take off like a helicopter. But, sir, what? Helicopter planes, Lieutenant. Hello everyone, Karnasa here, and welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind, and since my last episode, things have taken a bit of a turn. I did an episode called International Collaboration, then we had militarization from Beardy, then retaliation from N9, and now finally, VTOL Warfare from myself. You might think one Earth is going on, but first, before we get into the whole VTOL Warfare aspect of this episode, we have Beagle. Yes, I did leave the last episode on a little bit of a cliffhanger, showcasing the first launch of the European Space Agency's first vessel, the Ariane 1. It is a little different from a normal Ariane 1 in that it has four massive boosters on the side. They use the same engines as the first stage of the Ariane 1 though, just in a booster configuration. This was a sort of configuration that Ariane could fly, and for what I want this mission to do, I needed those boosters. So. Beagle, or Beagle, which is what this mission is designed on, was a Mars lander concept. I took some looks at some pictures of it, and I have tried to best replicate it as I can. And what it means, if this mission is successful, will mean that the European Space Agency is the first agency to soft land something on the surface of Mars. I'm going for a first here. I felt this was quite possibly one of the only things that I could have done. I do just about have the technology for it, and I know N9 did attempt to land something on Mars already, but that was considered a failure because the probe that landed on Mars did land, but it ran out of communications and it never effectively communicated back to Earth. So in this whole storyline, we don't know whether that landed on the surface of Mars or not. So the European Space Agency have said, we've got this great big new rocket that we want to try out, the Ariane 1, and we are going to attempt to land something on the surface of Mars. And that's what Beagle is of this mission. There is two parts of this mission though. The ME, the Mars Express, so it's basically the entire mission, at least what I could find of that mission online. The Mars Express was an orbiter that would stay in orbit around Mars whilst the Beagle lander landed on the surface. The Ariane 1 was completely successful in putting this probe into orbit though, and I did misspeak a little. The Beagle was not a concept, it was an actual flown mission. It just didn't work. 
Once it arrived at Mars in real life, the antenna were blocked by a couple of the solar panels that were supposed to unfoil. At least that's what I can gather from the information that I have read online about this mission. Bit of a shame because it was Britain's Mars lander and it didn't work once again because communications were a problem. And just like in real life, communications are a real thorn in our side in RSS RORP1 as well. And something that you do always have to kind of think about. And I can't wait to get up a communications network in this series, although that being said, Beardy has very kindly let me use his geostationary network, so for now I will be able to talk to my satellites because I will have Beardy's Svet network that I can just hijack for a little while if I want to. Anyway, I didn't talk much about the Ariane that actually brought this spacecraft into orbit. And it is a little different from a normal Ariane one. I know I mentioned about the boosters, but there is another change that I have made as well. The upper stage of the Ariane is powered by the RZ-20. Now that is the British Hydrolox engine. I've gone with that because that provides me relight. I can use that engine multiple times, which is exactly what I am doing right here to start my burn towards Mars. Now, the HM7, which is what is normally found on the Ariane 1, does not have relights, and I thought, as I'm using the RZ-20 anyway, I might as well use it for this vehicle. It's not quite as efficient, but it allows me to do maneuvers like I did, where I used a little bit of that stage to push me into orbit, and then I'm going to use the rest of that stage to get me all the way over to Mars, which you can see I have pretty much completed my burn now for. I am a little ways off, but I still have 200 odd meters per second of delta V to correct my Mars approach whilst I am still around Earth. Earth, because I only have near-Earth avionics on the upstage of the Ariane. There's no point putting deep space avionics on that. They're heavy, they're expensive, I don't need that for this stage. But it does mean that if I go to interplanetary space, the only way that I can make my final course adjustments is the engine on the final stage that will arrive at Mars. And that only has one burn, so I really don't want to use that until it's time to capture. But a very small 122 meters per second burn while still in Earth's orbit is enough to get me nearly on an impact course with the Red Planet. Something that I can easily change with a little bit of RCS on the final stage of this lander, which has now been released. Well, I say the final stage, there's actually a couple of stages on this. You've got the Beagle lander at the bottom, which I won't show yet because it will have to deploy once it lands on the surface of Mars and then we've got the Mars Express. Yes, those are the two final stages and we are on our way to Mars. Now, there is a lot about this mission that I feel I might have glossed over. And if you really want to find out more about it, please do join my Discord. There's a link in the description. I will go into more detail about it there if you've got any questions because I feel like I have missed a lot of what I wanted to say <laughs> over this video. But yes, no, there is a For All Kerbal Kind channel in my Discord. Go check it out and I will answer questions there. But we are on our way to Mars, hopefully to be the first agency to successfully soft land on its surface. And that would be really great for such a new agency. But all we have now is to set an alarm for just under a year. I think it's 283 days. I can't quite read that. I really should get my eyes checked if I'm going to be honest. But we are on our way and we're going to have to leave this for quite some time. So we're back at the Space Center now for the only Space Center section of this video where I pick up a supersonic X-plane contract and then realize in order to launch the TSR-2, I have to upgrade the runway. I did not think this was a thing in Realism Overhaul, but apparently it is in our install. So I went and did that before finally launching the TSR-2. Now, this was a British supersonic capable plane. One was built and flown, I'm fairly sure, but I don't actually know an awful lot about this plane. The reason why I have made it for this series is because it was a personal request from Beardy. Beardy has actually helped renovate one of these in real life and he really wanted to see it being flown in this series. So if you want to know more about this plane, definitely go over to his channel, go and pester him in the comments and say what exactly is up with the TSR2 because I don't know well, I know, I know a bit about it because I had to research it and look into it a little bit whilst I was making this video. But yes, Beardy knows a lot more about this than I do. But one thing that I do know is that this was a 
plane capable of going Mach 2 sub-radar altitude. And that's exactly what I want to do with it in this video. I want to make sure that we can go really as fast as I possibly can. Maybe like even Mach 2.5, I don't know. That might be a bit silly and I might burn the engines if I do that. But the afterburners have been activated whilst we are really high up. First things first, I wanted to check to make sure that this thing can go, well, Mach 3 at about 15 kilometers in altitude. Something to rival the KR-71 that N9 has. Obviously, I mentioned that at the beginning of this video, and that's kind of what this design of this plane is meant to be. It's a surveillance aircraft. We're not going to be strapping any bombs onto it or anything like that. No, this is purely for surveillance, trust me. But right now, what I'm doing is I'm flying about 100 meters above the ground and I am pushing this as fast as it can go. And we can just see we have now hit Mach 2 only 80 meters above the ground. This is quite a terrifying situation, but I guess that's what you get when you strap two of Concorde's engines onto the back of a much smaller plane than Concorde was. Yes, this is using the Olympus engines that do power Concorde. Now, once again, I didn't really know this and I'm just basing this off of what Beardy has told me, but he recommended that I use these engines because the engines used for the TSR2 were actually pivotal in designing Concorde's engine, so he said they're probably quite a good fit for this plane, which is why I went for them. You saw the first time that I attempted to land there, it did not go too well. I didn't slow down enough and I ended up taking off again, but this time we are back on the runway and we are able to bring the plane to a complete stop. Not pictured here, slightly after, is the plane however popping a wheelie. Here we are, on to the next plane in an episode of pretty much basically planes. I mean, we had the Ariane one at the beginning, but no one cared about that. You wanted VTOL Warfare, you wanted Harrier Jump Jets, you wanted the Kestrel. So I was told that the Kestrel was actually a working title, working title, working, work in progress. It was a working title, I guess is the right word. The, the name for the Harrier whilst it was still being designed, it was like an early version of the name that the Harrier would then come to be. And that's why this test vehicle for the Harrier that I am flying right now, which is a real pain to fly by the way, is called the Kestrel. So a lot of work went into making this work because there are no Harrier engines in realism overhaul. The closest I could get to doing them was taking some of the normal RO jet engines and sticking them on some infernal robotic hinges. However, because Realism overhaul jet engines, they model basically the entire jet, including like the turbine at the front. They are very long. So if you stick one of those on an infernal robotics hinge, it looks ridiculous. There are pictures on my Discord of the way that it looks sticking out the top of the plane. It does not look good. And I had to go in and make configs for a separate Harrier mod that I found so that I could actually put these in my game. And of course, I also had to land on top of the VAB with this because it's a helicopter plane. What else am I going to do with it other than land it on top of the VAB? This was really quite dangerous, to be honest. <laughs> I tried flying this several times in Sims. It's so hard to fly. It, it is so hard to fly. It yaws all over the place. It can't decide which way it's pointing. The throttle is a nightmare to try and keep control of like as you can see here I almost smacked into the ground again coming off of the VAB really not that fun to fly but it looks damn cool and it's probably one of my favorite British jet engines like I didn't know an awful lot about planes before starting this series or really before starting my YouTube channel I said still a lot I don't know about planes like I'm really not the plane person I am getting a little bit better at making them since Kerbal gets real redux and this series but yeah my, my plane knowledge is quite limited but the Harrier jump jet this is one I actually knew. I, I knew this plane, I, I recognized it, and I was like, I want to make this. So that's, that's one of the reasons why I've made it, and because, you know, a plane that takes off vertically, how cool is that? It is also actually quite accurate to the time period as well, because the first ever flight of a Harrier was December 1967, and this is January 1967, but we are in a bit of an accelerated timeline. I mean, we had moon landings in, what, 1965, I want to say they were? God, it's been so long since those episodes came out, I can't actually remember. I know I joined the series in 1964, just before they happened, so I think they took place in 1965. 
vibes. So yeah, accelerated timeline. But you can see now the Harrier not only flies, well, terribly in VTOL mode, but it can also fly pretty well as a plane too. In fact, I think this Harrier might be one of the most maneuverable planes I have ever designed in Kerbal Space Program. It really is a joy to fly around once you take it out of VTOL mode and you can take off and land with it in normal horizontal takeoff mode if that's even the right way of saying it as we are about to experience here I am now coming in and bringing it in for a horizontal landing we've seen a vertical takeoff we've seen a vertical landing on top of the vehicle assembly building I thought I would finish this flight with a horizontal landing on the runway you can see I'm coming down only about 94 meters per second at the moment it can really like maintain its pitch whilst traveling at these quite low speeds and then we hit the runway and unfortunately infernal robotic hinges as gear don't really work all that well so I'm gonna have to go back to the drawing board on those gear and figure out something else to do with the wings landing gear and I mean, it wouldn't be right if I didn't arm this plane as well, wouldn't it? So we have gone and got new landing gear on the wings and a whole barrage of missiles for this plane. And I mean, we're not going to be using them on anyone yet, but they are more of a deterrent. So if someone wants to come and maybe cause problems in our airspaces, well... Soviets, US, do, do, do know that we are armed and dangerous. We have very deadly plane flying in sky now. So on this Harrier, I don't really know missiles all that well either, if I'm going to be completely honest, but I've got eight smaller ones, which I'm going to say are air-to-air -air missiles. And then there are also four slightly larger ones, which I guess are air-to-surface missiles. Is that even a thing or are they just bombs? I don't know, but you can see we can also fly this in formation as well. That was all done in a simulation. That wasn't actually part of my save, but I thought those shots were just too cool to include in this final flight. It's a little bit of a collage of all of the different shots of the Harriers that I've got over filming this episode. This flight to install all of the missiles and to repair the wings on the Harrier only took another seven days. So this is on the 22nd of January, 1967. The last Harrier flight was the 15th of January. I really didn't want to push much further to allow Beardy and N9 to catch up, but now, missiles, fire! <laughs> this was so fun to film. I really should maybe play War Thunder a bit more and actually learn about these missiles and exactly what it is that I am firing into the Australian outback. Who knows? It could be something particularly deadly. Well, I suppose all missiles are deadly if you really think about it. But here we go, landing the actual flight rather than all of the simmed missions that I got that footage for. And yeah, that was uh, quite a nice flight in the end. A big thanks to Casey, CDR San, Opus, Redstone Wizard, Shadow Dev, Y Mandarin, Darth Malakor, Mr. Blue Star, Rail Cowgirl, Brian Miller, and the rest of my patrons and members for their continued support. I have been Karnasa, and I will see you later.